is ham radio really this vital link in communications during disasters that a lot of these ham clubs and organizations like to say that they are? Well, in this video, we're going to get into it. Okay, we're preparing to move the patient over to the LZ, and I just want to verify with you. <laughs> If someone has ever asked you who your favorite band is and you've responded back with the frequency range you like to operate in, go ahead and hit that like button. If you begin to start researching ham radio use for emergency operations, it does not take long for you to just be inundated with all of these clubs and organizations touting their abilities to help during these type situations. But does this really ring true? There are definitely examples of ham radio organizations coming in and providing assistance during large disasters. I won't deny that. But in the professional public safety world, we live by the mantra that you're really only as good as your last job. We know how important comms are, and on this channel, we are also aware that they will be one of the first things to break down. What I'm going to get into is directly related and using wildfires as the example because I am literally filming this from a wildfire. But I think the examples and the principles will hold true through the majority of disaster scenarios. So first off, the existing linked comm structures that we kind of just use and take advantage of in our daily lives, you should just assume are going to be down. Whether this is from your phone, internet, or cell services just being overloaded, it could also just be due to the fact that the fiber optic cable somewhere within the perimeter of the fire has burned through or the lines are just taken down, whether from trees coming down or even from, you know, cars driving erratically and crashing into a pole. This also holds true for any DMR systems that you are planning on relying on. Just assume and plan again, understand this is a link system and they will most likely be taken offline. In the public safety world, we already have this accounted for and our radio systems will just usually default to a fail safe mode. Also, I think the idea of having this ham radio you know, MCOM established netcom structure early on in an incident is just kind of a pipe dream. I know that may piss some people off, but this is my opinion based off a magnitude of real world experience. I mean, I just, with the Maui fires as the example, you have to understand that a lot of the members that make up these radio clubs, they are gonna be, any of the ones that are in that immediate evacuation area, they're going to evacuate with their families. And this is certainly not the wrong thing to do. I think it's a pretty safe bet that anyone that's watching this channel knows that when disaster strikes, you need to be able to communicate and gather intel. I mean, this is true in virtually any tactical situation out there. Information is always key. From a preparedness standpoint, I think everyone on this channel realizes that most people only usually think of the basics, that being food and water. How many people take true advantage to learn from past experiences? Remember COVID with the toilet paper? How many people are now stockpiling that? That is now probably a common prep because it affected so many people directly. Communications going down during a true emergency situation, not so many people have been directly affected or even experienced this. So where are we here or where am I going with this? Given all of that, what is the role of ham radio going to be? And well, right here, again, based on my personal experiences, let's just drop the term ham radio proper and focus on the ability to just conduct two-way communications, whether that's going to be HAM, GMRS, FRS, MERS, or even CB. So it is suffice to say that two-way handheld communications have certainly evolved. Back in 1996, the FCC authorized the Family Radio Service, which is what FRS stands for, in case you didn't know, and they designated frequencies for those radios so that users could communicate with no license to operate them. And these are your basic like Walmart bubble pack radios. In addition to that, there's also the general mobile radio service, which is what GMRS stands for. And that is similar to FRS, though there is licensing required with this through the FCC. 
and the GMRS license costs $70. It lasts 10 years, but it doesn't require an exam like the ham radio stuff does. One license covers an entire family, which is definitely really cool. And they make some really decent GMRS radios. So with these two, your FRS and your GMRS, they are both UHF radios, but GMRS radios have the potential for increased range and clarity due to the ability to have better antennas. They transmit on higher wattage and they have access to repeaters. Now, in the fall of 2000, the FCC created the Multi-Use Radio Service, which is what MERS stands for. And this uses channels in the 151 to 154 megahertz range. So this is operating in the VHF spectrum, which now just getting sidetracked here for a second. He is a good and smart master and he made me this collar so that I may talk. Squirrel! My master is good at I've done so many videos with these commercial and public safety radios testing between UHF and VHF. What is your thoughts on grabbing some bubble pack radios, some MERS, FRS, and GMRS ones, and doing some head-to-heads on those? Let me know your thoughts about that in the comments. So just a thought. Um, but again, so MERS, just like FRS, this also does not require a license to operate. So where I see this all coming together here, and from my experiences, is that number one, depending on how remote of an area you live, understand you may not have any warning by any established authority, and you just may be purely reliant on your neighbors or community. This could be from having your own comms plans established with a you know lookout type situation in place, or it could literally be you know from someone running up and knocking on doors to give an alert or just pass whatever information they're getting. Another reality here is you are probably going to want to evacuate with as much stuff as you can, which could include bringing multiple vehicles. And even if you weren't bringing several vehicles, if you are a part of a group, there will most likely be multiple vehicles involved in your convoy. And the reality here is that there's a very real possibility of becoming separated. Whether it's from heavy congestion, just from everyone else trying to evacuate and flee the area as well, or it could be from a tree coming down and you know causing separation and you can't see it because the visibility, depending on you know the weather, if it's raining, if it's super foggy, it's a wildfire situation, the smoke, your visibility can literally be zero at certain times. It could also just be getting diverted um, by law enforcement because they'll be trying to evacuate as many people as possible. And to do the traffic control, lights are not gonna be functioning. So they'll will be posted up in multiple intersections and they won't know who's part of your convoy, who isn't. They really won't care at that point. They're just gonna be sending people whichever way is, you know, the most convenient way at that exact minute. Thousands of people seeking shelter from the firestorm, stuck in a massive traffic jam today on Highway 99. With ashes flying through the air and an atmosphere filled with black smoke, the sun was blotted out from the sky as people fled a town called Paradise from a scene that was more like hell on earth. The Wilman family captured this video of flames all around them as they made a daring escape from their home. Uh, telephone poles were on fire and lines were down and the other side was still on fire. You can just feel the heat coming as you're just driving by and uh, we were like panic mode, shock mode. All of a sudden it just got dark, the power went out, no internet, no phones. So we just threw all our animals in and left. And here in Butte County, there are three shelters that have been established, but one of them we now understand. The one here in Chico has actually been filled to capacity, people now having to go elsewhere. Now scanners also have their role in situations like this, whether it's the so you're thinking scanners in the traditional sense or even SDRs, being able to hear what is going on around you by those tasks with trying to maintain an order, setting up the travel routes and responding to the primary activity areas would certainly be great information to be getting in. And here's where I'm going to put ham radios because not only can you program your local agency's frequencies in them, yes, a lot of them, especially on the law enforcement side are going to seven and 800 megahertz and adding encryption. There are also a lot of agencies that aren't doing it yet, and some also simulcast at least their main channels on different bands, plus the ability, again, the ham radio guys, they can sit there and hand jam frequencies into them from the front keypad is an awesome capability. Not to mention the knowledge base that a lot of hams possess where they can set up their radios to non-affiliate scan the majority of these channels. The homes, the homes are becoming a home. It's blackout conditions. Any unit. At the River Hospital, we've got four people trapped in the basement. Sounds like it's surrounded by fire. They're safe underneath, but they can't get out. Tell them to shelter in place. Someone's abandoned a vehicle in the roadway north of you. 
I'm going to try and get there on foot. Copy. Pee-wee Preschool still has kids there. Pee-wee Pee Preschool has kids there. Relay the Paradise PD that we need to start sheltering people in place at the hospital if we can. And we've got the fire uh, coming downtown Skyway. We're at Skyway and Moffy. We've got the road completely blocked. We need somebody to be able to open it up and get these people out of here. It's not looking good for us. Uh, get people out. We've got both sides of the road engulfed. The fire is starting to crowd in trees. Do we have any air assets that can drop water? West Air Resources to drop water there. Stand by. We have one patient approximately uh, burns over 45%. County, you must be advised, on Clark Road at Skyway, there's a woman in labor. She's in a beige Honda Pilot. She can see one of our deputies. Clark Road at Skyway, beige Honda Pilot. She's going to be honking her horn. Pretty far along, complications. Supposed to be a C-section. There's going to be a situation that's going to be fly flight out. Skyway, Clark, need a helicopter. 20 residents in the nursing home that are all non-ambulatory. They're concerned at the moment, and they're able, unable to reach through 911. These are the type of situations where I really see comms plans coming together and playing a role in the initial attack phase of disaster response. Having, and most importantly, knowing how to use your radios provide you with an awesome backup option to your primary, which is most likely going to be your cell phone comms. In addition to that, some of these radios, especially your ham, your commercial, and your GMRS ones, they can actually transmit text messages and GPS locations to each other. And I think this here is where I would kind of get into the importance of having the ability to do encryption, but this video is getting a little bit long, so I'm going to save that for another one. So getting back to the examples we started to get into, evacuation is a very realistic possibility for a huge swath of the country. We know between here and the U.S. and Canada, we have seen what is just a progressively worsening, you know, fire season after fire season. Now, when we think of wildfires, we pretty much just associate that to the entire Western United States, but this initial attack phase of the evacuation scenario doesn't stop or, you know, isn't limited to there. Keep in mind, on the other side of the United States, usually during that same peak wildfire season on the West, all those on the East Coast are continually bracing for what NOAA has always reported as a worsening and worsening hurricane season. South Carolina is expected to start feeling the storm's effects by tomorrow night. About a half million people have been ordered to evacuate. Every precaution in ordering this mandatory evacuation. In fact, we watched as Interstate 26, which is the main route out of here, filled with thousands of vehicles. So in order to reduce congestion, state troopers reversed the entire eastbound section. Just deteriorating conditions, catastrophic damage. Talking about power outages that could last months, if not uh, weeks, if not months. And more than 30,000 customers without power in the state so far. That number will grow. Ian left the entire island of Cuba without electricity. And in, and in the evacuation zones, they grew, especially down to our south yesterday. So you're trying to get two and a half million people out across inland areas that have limited number of highways. So traffic, obviously an issue. Travel times increased by two or three times to get inland. Now, yes, the main purpose of this video was for the implementation of emergency radio comms but it would be a disservice not to address the fact that if there is still cell service, people are gonna use their primary device, which will most likely be a, a phone. The overwhelming majority of us use dozens of apps, all dedicated to emergency preparedness. When shit does start to go bad, apps can help with navigating evacuation routes, locating temporary shelters, finding gas stations, and even tracking the storm or event themselves. So I didn't want to not address those because let's face it, if they're working and you have them, by all means, use them. I truly hope you enjoyed this. I love getting into comms. Any ideas or thoughts you have about any of this, please just leave it in the comments below. It should definitely lead to some really good discussion and idea sharing. I can't emphasize this point enough. Competency in what you are doing is always of the utmost importance. If you have a capability, be competent in it and continuously train. There are a huge amount of skill sets that are gonna be needed and they're gonna be an asset in situations like this. Tactical medicine and rescue being a big one. If you are interested in doing that type of training with us, medicineandbadplaces.com or ranchstrategies.com are the sites to go to. And with that, as usual, be safe.